So this is not just an Amazon thing. Um, here's a, a very quick example for Australia. You can see there, uh, using different scenarios for last glacial maximum and seeking these, these refugia, which they then uh, related to phylogeographic patterns. But I'm going to keep going with the Amazon. Uh, this is Chiphornis turdina. It's an uh, Amazon forest bird in plumage. It's about as boring as they get. But in terms of variation, it's actually pretty, pretty impressive. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to just seek one little bit of, of corroboration of last glacial maximum projections. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, ignore the, the dots and x's right now. I'm going to take the present day distribution of the species and develop a niche model, just like you guys have done. <coughs> and you can see the species gets up to southern Mexico, comes down Central America, down west of the Andes, pretty complex as far as within, among the Andes and Colombia, but then has a very uh, complete Amazonian distribution also here in, in eastern Brazil. Okay? Then I'm going to take that niche model and project it onto last glacial maximum conditions. And what you see is that what is presently continuous seems to break out of that. Okay? Now the other thing that you have on this map is the points from which we had samples. And those are shown in these colored squares. Those points, or those samples, fell into a bunch of phylogroups, which is to say this is a highly geographically structured species. In fact, a more modern view of the species would probably separate it into seven, uh, seven species. And so everywhere you see a different color, is a different phylogroup, group, okay? And the only question that I was trying to ask, or we were trying to ask in this study, was whether phylogroups, groups, which is to say independent evolutionary lineages, correspond to these refugia. So there are the phylogroups. groups. You can see them a bit better right now. Central American, Mexican thing, a Panamanian thing, uh, a very complex thing going on west and east of the Andes and northern Peru, and then these, these three groups. So what we want to ask is whether those are the occurrence points. I'll skip over the methods and better give you the paper. There are the refugia, essentially we split up those isolated areas in the crude projection to last glacial maximum conditions. And so each of these is an area that might have been a separate refugium for the species. And what we're going to ask is whether there's coincidence between the phylogroups groups from the molecular data and the refugia from the paleo climate. And so there are the phylogroups groups on top of the refugia. We're just going to ask whether there's a, whether there's a non random coincidence between the two. And so if I link uh, refugia and phylo groups at random, I get this distribution, which reflects basically a lot of non coincidence. And here's the observed, suggesting that indeed there is surprising coincidence, okay? Surprisingly few connections between phylo group and refugia. It's very uncommon that one phylo group is distributed in two refugia, or one refugium has two phylo groups. So this is a first sort of corroboration of the idea that these paleo refugium reconstructions based on climate actually translate into the genetic structure of species. We can also play around a bit and, and uh, learn some lessons. So this is, this is up in the northern Amazon and southern Venezuela. And we see one refugium and another, and this barrier. And so we can just 
play around. You guys can do this very easily. Uh, Google is the challenge on QGIS. Uh, but essentially, the suitable habitats are shown, the suitable sites are shown in black, and the unsuitable in white, and the ones that are kind of in between are in gray. And this is a plot of precipitation and temperature. And so you can see right away that the critical thing is high uh, precipitation. And the barriers were either too cold, too warm, or too dry. Okay, that's one barrier. And we can do the same sorts of things. Uh, here's minimum temperature of coldest month, maximum temperature of warmest month. And you see that the barriers occur when there are lower temperatures. So we can go beyond just there was a barrier, but we can also tell you what the barrier looked like in terms of climate. So here's a study that Kate uh, ended up with a rattlesnake that is distributed across uh, in the tropics of uh, the Americas. And essentially what you have is the Central American distributional area, and then two disjunct sets of populations, one here and one down here. And what you're seeing is what you're seeing is at present a quite fragmented distribution. And then under last glacial maximum conditions, you see that that fragmented distribution becomes more continuous. And so not only do we see the forest fragments retracting, that was what I showed you before, but here we show you a dry land species that's expanding into that area of the Amazon. And then back to um, fragment. That's, that's just a, a little illustration that we can get some geographic detail about the dynamics of these ecosystems. You should be thinking, wow, I've got the same set of circumstances on this continent, probably a lot of relevant data, but there's some, there some ways you can reflect on these, on these questions. So now I'm going to tell you about a kind of an extension of this where I started thinking about Okay, that's the Amazon. In the Amazon, presently, or at least until recently, the rainforest is quite continuous. And 20,000 years ago, in the global cool period, the rainforest was quite discontinuous. Okay? But what do forest uh, systems worldwide look like in those terms? So I looked at forest bird species in nine world regions. And I'm going to do essentially the same thing that I just showed you. I'm going to project back to last glacial maximum conditions. Then I'm going to ask whether it's more or less fragmented when the global climate is warm or cool. So those are the nine regions around the world. North America, the Andes, the Amazon, southeastern Brazil, West Africa, East Africa, Madagascar, <coughs> South Asia, and the Philippines. Okay, and those are the occurrence points across the nine uh, bird species that I looked at. So here are some just examples. This is a, a tanager in, in the Amazon, and here is a camera. Sorry, that was last interglacial, so the last global warm period, last glacial maximum, and present. And so again, we see continuous, retracted the cool period, Here in Madagascar, uh, Archipteraceus leptosomus, and you see last interglacial continuous distribution, last glacial maximum, kind of a massive disjunction reconstructed, and present more or less continuous. Now, those two were both similar. They were 
connected in warm periods and disconnected in cool periods. Now, let's go into the Andes. Here is Aburia, which is a guan. And you can see its present distribution has some major breaks. And those major breaks actually do structure herd populations pretty massively. There's last glacial maximum. Sorry, the first one was last interglacial. This is last glacial maximum, and that's present. And so there we're seeing the opposite pattern. Oh, sorry, sorry. Relatively disconnected at last interglacial, connected at last glacial maximum, and disconnected at present. Let's go to the Philippines. Okay. One of the big doves, and oceanic pigeons. Uh, last interglacial, last glacial maximum, last interglacial. In the Philippines, you have two things going on. Connectivity via coastlines and connectivity via climatic footprint. But in both cases, you get greater connectivity in the cool period than in the warm periods. And so, if we think about global climate and global temperature, we have last interglacial, last glacial maximum, and the present. Essentially, we end up with this picture. Four of the regions that I analyzed, North America, the Amazon, West Africa, and Madagascar, show much greater uh, connectivity in the warm periods. So the cool periods would be essentially a, an isolation phase or a speciation phase. And during the warm periods, three regions show greater fragmentation. So essentially, we have the world is kind of a mosaic. So speciation in cool periods, wherever you see blue. Speciation or fragmentation in warm periods, wherever you see red. And then two regions where it really didn't get a clear signal. So that paper is about to come out in global wide geography what we call it in biogeography. Let's, let's skip this. It's okay, so from this study, what do we see? Kind of this world mosaic idea. But there's some really interesting things going on here. Uh, one, different regions should differ in their speciation histories rather markedly, but also that those time estimates that I showed you examples of earlier, well, one, they're way too inaccurate. Any error bars on them lose all of this dynamic completely. But also, uh, those who would argue that no speciation took place in the Pleistocene, I'm not sure I'm convinced, and I think as molecular data get better and time estimates get better from molecular data, I'm suspecting that we'll see the molecular data converge on younger speciation events and we'll see more corroboration between this data stream and the molecular data stream. So I'll show you just a, a bit of a piece of work done by another former student uh, Yoshi Nakasawa. Uh, essentially, what Yoshi did was to move away from real species, go back to that trick of simulated species or virtual species, and then use those not to fix the methods, but instead as kind of a probe to detect historical patterns. And so, essentially, this will give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. This is one uh, M, essentially one area that's pretty continuously accessible to a forest bird species or, or many other species. In the Amazon, it's between the Rio Madeira and the Rio Solimoj. <coughs> essentially, what I'm showing is Last glacial maximum conditions in triangles, uh, pre present day conditions as squares, and last interglacial conditions as X's. And then you can't see them all. But what I want you to see is that there's a big area of overlap. 
Okay? So that's in the Amazon. Um, this is Jamaica. With the same visualization. What I want you to notice is that the two warm periods, last interglacial and last glacial maximum, are up here. And the, sorry, last interglacial and the present. And the last glacial maximum is down here. And the overlap is quite minimal. And so a species that's going to survive the cool periods in Jamaica has to